us through a presentation um, on the history of Gaelic in the Northeast. So thank you very much. I just unmute myself. Thanks very much, Chloe. Thank you for introducing me. And thanks for asking me to talk to our alumni today about Gaelic in the Northeast of Scotland, and really with a focus also on Gaelic at the University of Aberdeen. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michelle McLeod, and I am Professor of Gaelic here at the University of Aberdeen. Um, I'm also an alumni of the University of Aberdeen. Um, so as alumni, you probably recognise that image on my first slide. It's not participatory, so I can't see whether you recognise that or not. But um, this is the tomb of Bishop Elphinstone, the founder of the University of Aberdeen. So the tradition of Gaelic at the University of Aberdeen really goes back to its foundation. We know, we assume that Bishop Elphinston uh, at least learned to read the learned literary dialect, which we refer to as classical Gaelic, when he was Bishop of Ross between 1481 and 1483. Um, and the fact that we have the old form of Gaelic language around his tomb is symbolic of his connection to the language and also, I think, symbolic of the university's um, association, very long association with Gaelic in the university. S but uh, Gaelic in Aberdeen, Gaelic around Aberdeen, um, has a longer history, of course, than the foundation of the university. So I'm going to step back in time a little bit further to talk about the historical and linguistic origins of Gaelic around this area. Um, but first of all, Gaelic in Scotland. Um, and before I, I get on with that, I'm going to excuse myself by saying I am not a historian. That is not my area of expertise. I'm very much a scholar of modern Gaelic. Nonetheless, I'll do my best to guide you through um, the history of uh, Gaelic in Scotland and Gaelic in the Northeast particularly, and then talk about uh, Gaelic at the University of Aberdeen. So brief linguistic introduction, just in case that's necessary. Um, Gaelic, like Irish and Manx, belongs to the Goidelic family of Celtic languages. It is a Celtic language. It's closely related to Irish and Manx and less closely related to Welsh, Breton and Cornish, um, those being uh, Brythonic or P-Celtic languages. Scottish Gaelic derived from the form of the Gaelic language the Irish settlers took with them to Scotland when they first started arriving, um, probably as early as 300 AD, sporadic settlement patterns in the south and west of Scotland, but certainly major settlements um, from 500 AD onwards. Um, in particular, we think about the kin group known as the Dalriadh. These are the Irish settlers that moved from the north coast of Ireland across maybe 15 miles of water to Argyll and took with them Irish language as it was then, but the form of Gaelic language, which um, then spread throughout Scotland. So when they, they, these settlers arrived, they made their home first of all in Argyll and the old Gaelic name for Argyll is Orhir Nangael, which actually means coastland of the Gaels. When they arrived, of course, there was no concept of the country we now know as Scotland. That didn't happen for several more centuries. Instead, push the wrong button, there we go. Instead, um, instead of Scotland, we have um, a group of different uh, kin groups or tribes, different political organisations in, in the, the geographic area we come to know of as Scotland. So when the Gales first arrived in Argyll, they, they 
settled there. Um, but they very quickly wanted to expand north and east. And they um, subdued the Picts, as you can see there in the orange, um, first of all, probably around about the ninth century. Um, and the new merged territory of the Gales and the Picts was called Scotia and also called Alba. So there we get the first usages really of, of Alba as a territory that later becomes known as modern Scotland. Alba, as you probably know, is the, the Gaelic, the modern Gaelic for Scotland. When the Gaels moved east, they moved the centre of their church from Iona to Dunkeld, first of all, and then later Dunfermline. Um, their seat of power was in nearby Schoon. So really we're thinking kind of centre Scotland, but east, we're beginning to move east. East is becoming important to the Gaels um, in Perthshire. And when they moved to Schoon, they took the important king-making stone on which all their kings had been proclaimed to that point. Um, you will, of course, no doubt recognise this as the Stone of Destiny, uh, last seen in King Charles's coronation a few months ago. Um, and this is the stone that was allegedly there's a lot of discussion about the authenticity of this particular stone, but um, the stone allegedly came from Ireland to Scotland when the Gaels migrated and um, was used to crown Scottish kings thereafter and following the union of the crowns was taken south until, well, the end of last century when it was returned to Scotland. Um, so, having secured the Pictish territories, the Gaels, um, or Scots, as they were also called by historians, turned their attention to the British Kingdom of Strathclyde in the um, southwest, kind of where modern Strathclyde is, um, around Glasgow. Um, and at that time, this was inhabited by a group of uh, Pequelts, so they would have been speaking a language very similar to Welsh at that point. Um, thereafter, the Gaels turned their attention to the Angles who'd arrived around Lothian. So by the 11th century, the Gaels had um, conquered all of the different groups within Scotland, apart from um, obviously Orkney and Shetland. So they brought together the territory we now know as modern Scotland, all four Dark Age kingdoms under one Gallic throne. And it's important to note, I think, um, in relation to the history of Gallic, uh, the history of Scotland and the history of Gallic in Scotland is that the, that the first royal courts of Scotland were Gallic. Courts. This didn't last long, however. Um, the first king of the Scots Picts included Angles and Strathclyde, Strathclyde was um, Duncan in 1034. Um, and this is Duncan of uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth fame. He was a Gallic king, but by all accounts, he was not a, a great king. He was killed by his cousin Macbeth. Um, who was murdered 17 years later by Duncan's son. You know, if, if you've read or studied Shakespeare or know the story, you know all of these characters. But these are all Gallic kings. That's why I'm talking about them just now. Um, but the, the final Malcolm I mentioned there, um, who became king in 1057, was Malcolm III. And we generally think that it was during the reign of Malcolm III and his wife, Queen Margaret, St. Margaret, that we see the cultural and linguistic orientation of the court, of the Royal Court of Scotland, beginning to change from a Gallic court um, to a court which favoured Norman French, English, Scots. 
But bringing back our focus into the northeast and around Aberdeenshire. Um, so before the Gales arrived here, this was, of course, Pictish territory in the early Middle Ages. There was probably Gaelic speaking presence in ecclesiastical institutions during the Pictish period, but gradually Gaelic displaced Pictish and was the dominant language in what is now Aberdeenshire by about the turn of the millennium. The long history of Gaelic in the area is demonstrated in a great many place names. We use place name evidence to, to tell us when a place was settled uh, and how perhaps um, the earlier combination of languages shows us that the Gaels were here quite early. So here we've got some Pictish and Gaelic place names. Um, I've picked out words with the, the Pictish pit, meaning share or portion, portion of land. Um, and here we've got Pic Capel. Um, for Capel is an old Gaelic word for horse. So it's a place where people kept horses. Pit Sligo um, gives a, comes from Schlicke for shell. Pit Cary uh, from Cary for, for a, a weir. So these are a combination of Gaelic and Pictish place names. Certainly, certainly in the centuries between the extinction of Pictish towards the end of the first millennium and the establishment of Scots as the dominant language of Aberdeen, when the town became a borough town in the 12th century, Gaelic was the dominant language in the area. It almost certainly lasted longer in the hinterlands of the borough and certainly within rural Aberdeenshire and Grampian, which I'll return to just shortly. We can use place name evidence from the city to show us um, Gaelic's presence in the city. So we have Balnagask, Balnagask, the settlement of the tail of land, the small bit of land, um, Bogskithi, um, Bogskioch, the Hawthorne Bog, Mondarno, in Monagdurnach, the, the pebbly hill pasture. Um, we also have a few mixed Gaelic and Scots place names in Aberdeen, such as Gilcomston. Um, this combines a Gaelic personal name, Gilia Hallam, with the Scots generic element Toon. So it would be um, Gilia Hallam's town. Now, more research is needed, I think, to gain a better picture of Gaelic and medieval Aberdeen. But there's some good evidence that there was a Gaelic speaking community deep into the second millennium in the city. <clears throat> the best known explicit reference to Gaelic comes from the statutes of the city's grammar school written in 1553. Among the regulations concerning the daily rounds of prayers, classes and meals is a stipulation concerning the languages that the boys were permitted to, to use. And in Latin, it says, uh, and it's a long time since I've um, studied Latin, loquanta omnis latine greke hebraeke galice hibernice nunquam vernacule saltum cum his qui latini noscant. All shall speak Latin, Greek, Hebrew, French, or Gallic never the vernacular, apart from those who do not know Latin. Now, the forbidden vernacular in this case was must have been Scots, um, and we can infer that the exception granted for those um, who are allowed to use the vernacular um, would be the ones that had not yet learnt Latin to a reasonable conversational level. And this seems to imply that while other languages were permitted. Latin was the language most commonly used by the scholars and instructors at the school. But 
given that the permitted languages included classical and biblical languages, it is likely that the Gallic referred to in these statutes was the formal um, literary language that we now refer to as classical Gallic rather than the spoken vernacular Gallic. Um, the classical language of um, classical Gallic language of Scotland um, was a, a learned literary language on the same status as you can see here as, as Latin and, and Greece. It was known um, across Europe, um, certainly used in um, churches and for um, <clears throat> in literary documents. One place of particular importance in the history of Gaelic in the North East uh, specifically is the village of Deer, about 20 miles north of Aberdeen, because it was in the Abbey of Deer that Gaelic text was written um, for the first time, which showed divergence from the shared language with Ireland. So this is a really important text for historians of the language um, of Gaelic. The Book of Deer is a manuscript consisting mostly of the Gospels written in Latin, um, along with other religious material. You might just be able to, to see it on your screens in front of you. This is a picture I, I took myself when the Book of Deer, which normally is housed in Cambridge, returned to Aberdeen just last year um, when the City Council with um, the Book of Deer and the Ab Abbey of Deer um, local organisation in collaboration with the university arranged a, an exhibition, a really wonderful exhibition celebrating um, the Book of Deer because it's important for in relation to the history of the Gaelic language, but it's also a really important historical text um, for this area and for Scotland altogether. So if you can just about see this image here, um, you can see the Latin text in the center, but what you might also be able to see is um, text around the margins. Now by the 12th century, the monks at uh, Dear Abbey were using blank spaces on the pages to record it, uh, varied information, the monastery's foundation legend, and also information about land grants, um, money, people, that kind of thing. It's a really fascinating document in terms of information it shares with us. But linguistically, it's important because the type of Gaelic that is used here it shows signs of divergence from the Irish norms and indications now of a distinctively Scottish Gaelic, closer to the spoken dialect of the area than to the um, pan-Gaelic standard across Scotland and Ireland. So by this point in time, um, around about the, the between the 10th and 12th century, um, Gaelic had been spoken in Scotland for more than 500 up to 700 years so we would expect to see divergence we would expect that the languages of Scotland and Ireland had begun to diverge over a period of time and here we see that the first evidence of it. Gaelic it continued to be spoken in Aberdeenshire well after the medieval period. According to Charles Withers, um, Gaelic had largely given way to Scots by about 1600 in the coastal and east central areas of Aberdeenshire. Uh, but well into the 18th century, it was the dominant or really the only language spoken by many in the eastern Grampians with accounts from 1716 and 17 and 1732, showing that the parishes of Crathy, Bremar, Glenmuck, Tullough, 
uh, Glengarn and Cargar in Strathdon, that these were largely Gaelic speaking. Certainly, the Church of Scotland considered that proper pastoral coverage in this part of the country could not be supplied without uh, Gaelic speaking clergy. And a uh, Gaelic speaking probationer was sent to Aberdeenshire in 1700. Church records also show that Gaelic Bibles and catechisms were distributed to parishioners in Crathy and Glenmuck in 1706, that the Reverend James Dunbar was appointed to parish in Braemar in 1739, but was recalled because he had no Gaelic and was not able to communicate efficiently with his parishioners. Um, in around 1770, the minister at um, Monaltry habitually preached in both Gaelic and English. Gaelic worship continued in Ballater up until 1809. The Gaelic speaking population of this area declined sharply in the 19th century, part due to the clearing of communities to make way for sporting estates for the elite just as happened elsewhere in the Highlands and Islands um, with resulting um, disastrous effects on, on their Gaelic speaking communities as well eventually. But the language still had strongholds in Grampian area in right up until the 19th century. For instance, Gaelic was spoken by almost a fifth of the population of Crathy and Braemar as late as 1881. And a decade later, over 80% of the population of the village of Inveray were still Gaelic speakers. By the early decades of the 20th century, those communities had effectively ceased to exist. Um, and the language, though the language was still transmitted just by a few families for a little while longer. The 1911 census showed 527 Gaelic speakers in the county, of whom only 20 were under the age of 21. And when we begin to find um, low percentages of population at a young age, we, this is when um, intergeneral transmission of a language is really poorly affected. So the last fluent speaker of Aberdeenshire Gaelic, um, the dialect spoken in Aberdeenshire natively, um, is believed to have been Mrs. Jeannie Bain of Braemar, and she died in 1984. She was recorded by researchers from the School of Scottish Studies, so we do have record of her speech um, in the late 1970s and 1980s. At, at that point, however, she said she'd not used her language much for about 50 years. However, towards the end of her life, her son um, informed people that um, she reverted to speaking Gaelic towards the end of her life. And she was able to speak Gaelic with one of her nurses who looked after her because the nurse was um, a Gaelic speaking Islander. I want to come back. Uh, to Gaelic at the University of Aberdeen, kind of historically, first of all. I've already mentioned Bishop Elphinstone, and certainly he would have known at least the classical Gaelic language, if not the Gaelic vernacular. Um, I want to just highlight a couple of other important Gaelic scholars that have um, been in Aberdeen since then. One such prominent scholar was Ewan McLachlan. 1775 to 1822. He was a, a native of Loch on the West Coast. He was educated at King's College and he became the librarian here in 1800. He began work on his trilingual Latin Gaelic English Dictionary, uh, which was published in two volumes as Dictionorium Scoto Celticum in 1828, six years after his death. Um, he also was a, a great translator um, and editor. He edited the Gaelic translations of James Macpherson's Ocean, and he 
com nearly completed a translation of the Iliad, which is still regarded as um, a top rate um, translation piece of work. And in honour of Ewan MacLachlan's success as a translator and as a Gaelic scholar, we here at the university um, now host the National Centre for Gaelic Translation, named in his honour, the Inad, uh, Inad Eterhengehi Ewan MacLachlan, the um, Ewan MacLachlan um, Translation Centre. Other interesting, I think, historical facts of Gaelic at the university. Um, perhaps, you know, you're alumni of the University of Aberdeen. Perhaps some of you were also members of the Aberdeen Celtic Society or Coman Kirchach Ol Hai Uperein, one of the oldest societies at the university today, having been formed in 1853. Certainly when I was a student, it was one of the largest, one of the biggest student societies. It has, it has um, not been as successful in recent years, but following the pandemic, the students are now motivated to reinvigorate the society. And I'm pleased to see that it's really um, bouncing back quite well now. Um, the late 19th and early 20th centuries saw important scholarly work in Celtic and Gaelic studies, even though there was no department of Celtic or Gaelic at the university until the start of the 20th century. The university started teaching Gaelic when its de Celtic department was founded in 1916. And in its early years, the focus was on historical linguistics and literary studies. And most of the students, if not all of the students at that point, would have been native Gaelic speakers, a situation which has changed now in the modern era. The first Gaelic lecturer at the university was John Fraser, a native of Inverness. He um, left Aberdeen in 1921 to become the Jesus College Professor of Celtic at the University of Oxford, and to date he's the only Scot who has held this position. Fraser's successor as lecturer in Gaelic was John MacDonald, in whose tenure the um, journal Scottish Gaelic Studies was established. And this has been published at the department since 1926. And I'm currently the editor in this leading journal in the field. Um, and at nearly 100 years old. Um, the journal is an absolute treasure trove now of Gaelic scholarship and Gaelic um, cultural knowledge. So I'm beginning to come towards the end of my talk now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening in Gaelic at the university today. But before I get to there, I want to um, contextualise this about uh, Gaelic in Scotland, first of all. So since a question about Gaelic ability was first asked on the Scottish census in 1891, the language has declined dramatically, as you can see from this visual. From approximately a quarter of a million speakers in Scotland in 1891, um, we are down to around about 60,000 speakers in uh, 2011. And I don't have more up to date um, figures on Gaelic speakers as the most recent um, numbers haven't been made available to us yet. Now, this is an interesting image, I think, in front of you. It shows very clearly the decline of the language, but also how the language has moved north and west. Uh, so the heartlands are still are really just now located in the very um, in the very west, in the west, the periphery of the islands of uh, Lewis, Harris, some parts of Skye, Tyree, and so on. There, um, this map also shows density the way it's coloured. So these are really Gaelic speaking communities. What this map can't show you, and I don't have time to go into um, speaker numbers in detail, um, is it doesn't show you that now um, around about half of all Gaelic speakers live outside Gaelic speaking communities. With 9,000 speakers of Gaelic in Glasgow, 
and around 3,000 speakers of Gaelic in Aberdeen City and Aberdeenshire. Um, so these won't be uh, native Gaelic speakers of Aberdeenshire Gaelic anymore. These will be people who've either moved into the area or who have learned the language in the area and live in the area. So that image is a pretty bleak image. Um, is, is Gaelic on the way out? I would like to think not. Uh, it's really an important part of the cultural heritage of Scotland. And since the 1980s, very many efforts have been made to um, support Gaelic in Scotland. Um, and just very quickly, some of them um, you may be aware, for example, of Gaelic medium education. This is where children receive part or all of their education through the medium of Gaelic. There's now a, just under 4,000 pupils receiving all of their primary education through the medium of Gaelic across Scotland and um, around 1,300 uh, receiving some education in, um, the, in, in the secondary schools in Gaelic. Uh, there's a lot been done for promoting and increasing Gaelic broadcasting, primarily through BBC Alba, the Gaelic television channel, but also elsewhere on radio and on social media. Hopefully, you've been aware of uh, a vibrant Gaelic arts and music scene. Um, I think of all parts of the Gaelic community or Gaelic society, um, Gaelic music has enjoyed a, a really revived interest. There's a lot of enthusiasm for Gaelic music and arts um, across Scotland and globally. Community work is vitally important and we see, we see more and more um, initiatives happening within Gaelic speaking communities to support the language there, often funded um, through Board na Gaelic and initiatives via the Gaelic Language Scotland Act. So the, the, the Gaelic Language Scotland Act 2005 made provisions to establish a language board, Board na Gaelic, whose uh, primary aim is to inform Scottish ministers to oversee the publication of the National Gaelic Language Plan and also um, to ask public authorities to produce statutory Gaelic language plans to, um, to show how they will support Gaelic language. And I'm going to end today by just talking about what we do at the University of Aberdeen because we are also partly at least a public authority and we have also been asked to um, create a Gaelic language plan and I realise now that the font on that slide is particularly small so let me talk you through what I have there. Um, at the University of Aberdeen, our Gaelic language plan commits us to improve, uh, develop a Gaelic corporate identity. So if you were to come onto campus now, you would likely come across several bilingual signs. Um, the picture here of the front gate is in both English and Gaelic. Um, many other signs across campus are bilingual as part of our commitment in our Gaelic language plan. Um, we try and make sure that information goes out occasionally bilingually, um, that we raise the profile through our social media by occasional posts in Gaelic also. Of course, the main thing that we can contribute as an institution is through teaching and research. We continue to have Gaelic language degrees at undergraduate level and also postgraduate level with students coming to us from Scotland, but also from across the globe, wonderfully. Um, in the early days, the majority of students when Gaelic was first taught here at university, the majority of students were native Gaelic speakers. As I said earlier, that is now no longer the case. And we teach a lot of students from complete beginner um, right up to uh, 
when they leave after four years that they will be able to then obviously work through the medium of Gaelic. Um, we contribute to Gaelic research. In, in my own department, we have particular expertise in developing learning and teaching resources and understanding how people learn language. We have expertise in translation studies. We have expertise in modern literature, theatre and society, and also in Gaelic language planning, where we, uh, some of our research has been used to influence um, policies around supporting Gaelic language. And, and we continue to do outreach work, working with local and national uh, organisations to support the Scottish government's aims and objectives with regard to promoting the language. So finally, just to finish off, um, as, as you will no doubt know, the University of Aberdeen was founded on the promise of being open to all. At its foundation, it was open to, to Gaelic speakers and its service to its local community, which included Gaelic speakers um, in its very near vicinity. It remains open to Gaelic speakers across Scotland and those with an interest in our rich culture and traditions from across the globe. It serves its Gaelic community, Scottish society, to protect against further endang endangerment through its teaching, research and outreach activity at a really crucial point in Gaelic's history. As numbers of speakers ha have declined so dramatically across the last century, the university has committed to support Scottish government policy, which seeks to arrest decline and celebrate Scotland's founding language. Thank you for listening. I'm quite happy to take questions now. Tap alive. Thank you very much. Um, I will hop on. Um, I will admit now I do not speak Gaelic, so I will very much be relying on Michelle. Um, if anyone puts anything in the in the chat, I'm, I'm hoping what's maybe just been written is maybe thank you. Um, but yeah, so okay, I will Michelle. If you're maybe happy to to <laughs> to read yeah. out, um, if you could also maybe read the yeah. back in English, that would be perfect. Yeah. yeah. So a very delicious. Is there any connections between the University of Aberdeen and Nova Scotia? Well, no, there aren't at the moment, which is unfortunate because um, obviously Nova Scotia um, was a Gaelic speaking community, is a Gaelic speaking community and um, has, I'm aware of so many vibrant and interesting initiatives happening in Nova Scotia that we could learn from here in Scotland, but also it would be nice to support uh, to support our Gaelic speakers um, over there also. Hope Thank that you. answered your question, Pam. Thank you. Um, yeah, like we said, if there's any um, questions, obviously just please feel free to, to put them in the chat. Um, I was actually wondering, I haven't really ever kind of, I've not really asked about this, the student population that we have. So do a lot of the students speaking who come to kind of learn Gaelic at the university, do they come from kind of Gaelic, generally, do they come from kind of Gaelic speaking communities or regions that kind of have a, a richer connection or is it just completely broad and really diverse? Yeah, good question. I mean, I think it changes from year to year. Um, we will get some students from Gaelic speaking communities, um, so from, from the island communities, but we get students uh, from across Scotland, some who have come through the Gaelic medium education system. So have um, I've got a student, I don't think it's breaking confidence at the moment, uh, from a school in Edinburgh who did her um, primary and secondary school education through the medium of Gaelic in Edinburgh and she's come up to Aberdeen to study Gaelic here but I also have students who have had no Gaelic in, in the past and have come from um, largely Scotland nowadays but also internationally um, to study with us just because they're interested perhaps because it's in their history in their family or just because they've got a, a, a general interest in, in Scotland or uh, in Gaelic. Great, thank you. 
Um, so we've got a question that's saying, um, apart from Jean Bain, are there any other sources of Aberdeenshire Gaelic that were recorded before um, it passed? Um, there, I think that the School of Scottish Studies does have some other recordings of maybe not um, Aberdeenshire, but certainly um, a little bit further south. Uh, around around the south part of the Cairngorms, if, there's, if, if you understand your geography. Um, there is, people also recorded it in writing. So uh, one of my predecessors here at the university did a lot of research looking at um, texts that were written about the folklore of the Grampian region for want of a better term um, and was able to trace uh, aspects of the dialect there. So there are a couple of sound files I think, additional sound files on the School of Scottish Studies. Um, there's certainly sound files for other Eastern Highland Gaelic um, and, and then some written sources as well. Thank you. And I feel like in the past like minute, there's been a little flurry of questions, which is fab. Um, and I've also learned that uh, Amanda, I've just learned what thank you trans translates as because I googled that. Um, so from Connor, um, is there any effort to revitalize specific northeastern dialects of Gaelic or would this be a much longer term goal once the decline has been reversed? I'm not aware of any efforts to revitalize um, any of the northeastern dialects of Gaelic because um, Connor, I don't know who Connor is, but is obviously aware of the fact that um, the dialect that was spoken by Jeannie Bain, for example, would be very different from the dialect of Gaelic that, that I speak coming from the West Coast. Um, but that doesn't mean that individual speakers don't attempt to um, to use one of the older dialects that's really not spoken anymore. I've certainly known people who've um, done a great job of um, written recorded evidence from, from the, the linguistic atlas or from sound files or from descriptions of Gaelic that have been able to, um, to speak a, a, a dialect um, of a local place. But at the moment, no, I don't know of any targeted initiatives to reintroduce Aberdeenshire Gaelic or for people, groups of people learning Aberdeenshire Gaelic. Um, or northeastern dialects, yeah. Thank you. I'll also let you take the lead with the next yeah. question, Michelle. That's okay. Uh, okay. Has to be look brainy in the Gaelic pool. Just have you found that the two is a bad word? If all Arab and reaching on the Canadian side, who are the hard to the Arab is sure. Okay, interesting question. Um, so, Ferrach is asking. Um, he he knows that Gaelic speakers tend to stay in 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 the country and rural areas instead of in the city. Are there any numbers um, to prove this relating to the Northeast? Um, I think you could poo, prove that. I think you will see that in some of the census figures. When I was looking at the census figures for, um, for this, I don't have my notes to kind of show me how I came up to that 3000 figure of Gaelic speakers um, around the city and, and the, the Shire, but I think it was relatively evenly split. And therefore, given the density of population, I think Ferreja could be right that there are more uh, higher density of Gaelic speakers living outside of the city, but I, I'm not sure. It would be able to be relatively easy to work that out. Uh, it might be worth waiting now till the 2022 census figures come out so we can have a look at that. Thank you. Um, the next one's from Duncan, who says, um, are all of your students who are taking Gaelic, um, just pop that back up, um, are they taking Gaelic as their main subject? Or do some of them have other main subjects and then join your classes? Yeah, good question. So, um, no, they don't all take Gaelic as their main subject. We have a, a mixture. We'll have some doing single honours um, Gaelic studies. Uh, we'll have some doing joint honours Gaelic studies with 
whatever. Um, and we also have students, um, because at the university we're able to offer disciplinary breadth. Some students, I've had students studying law. I've got, stu I've got a student just now doing uh, an LLB with Gaelic. Um, I've got students in the business studies school who are doing business degrees with Gaelic. Um, we quite regularly get medicine students that come to take a term with us of Gaelic because it's built into the, the medical degree at the university that they can do a bit of humanities studies on their third year. So Gaelic is available to students um, for whatever subject that they are studying if they want to come and study with us for a short time. And it really enriches the classes, I think, to have a breadth of students there. Yeah, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that either. And I think that's really interesting. And I guess, like you say, when you've got such a diverse mix of backgrounds, you've got a diverse mix of like insights and different ways of, I guess, looking at the language and the, the learning process, which is really good as well. Um, so our next question, um, I recently read that the textbook Gaelic used by learners, um, even if they become really fluent in it, um, is felt by ancestral native speakers to to fail to reach the essential soul of the language. It doesn't really give learners insight into the real idiomatic speech. Is there any way around this? Okay, yeah, this is, this is a good question. Um, I think um, any time we learn a language, and I know Derek's got plenty of experience of language learning, uh, but if we, if, when we learn language or when we teach language, um, there's only so much that you can uh, acquire or achieve in a classroom or via a textbook. Um, and thereafter, it's important that people immerse themselves in the language. Now, with a minority language like Gaelic, it's really difficult to get that immersive experience to fully acquire to um, language and idiomatic language. Um, I think that I think that there are differences in terms of the acquisition process with Gaelic um, as a minority language compared to if, um, the student who is learning a majority language and especially because so many Gaelic speakers, um, native Gaelic speakers, traditional Gaelic speakers, older Gaelic speakers would not have been um, literate in the language. And, um, and, and therefore their oral skills were very, very rich. So I think there is a big gap. Um, I think just trying to, to bring um, our Gaelic students closer to the community um, would be a, a great advantage to helping them um, improve their acquisition. But I think that I think that there are many very fluent Gaelic learners out there who speak um, brilliant Gaelic. Um, so I don't worry that they don't have the soul, but I, I I understand I understand the point that the Gaelic might be different. Thank you. Um, so our next question, Amanda saying that was so interesting. Um, was the decline in Gaelic um, from kind of 1891 uh, purely because of like the clearances or were there other factors? Um, I think there were probably many factors and it had been in decline before 1891. It was just that we don't have good um, statistical evidence. So 1891, we get data from the census, so we can really begin to track it clearly from that point onwards. Um, the language had been in decline, um, I think I kind of alluded to it almost from um, the, the 11th century when it hit that high spot as the language of the court. And then there were so many um, social, political um, reasons for, for the decline of Gaelic in Scotland from that point, um, that certainly the clearances had an impact, but there were there were other reasons also. Thank you. Um, and so far, that is the, the kind of conclusion point of the questions. Um, I think we'll just say thank you. Um, I was going to ask another one of my own questions. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, like, how I guess the efforts um, by the kind of Scottish government, how that compares to things that are being doing by like the Welsh government to kind of obviously revitalise and maintain like the Welsh language and history, um, 
yeah, I'm just intrigued to yeah. kind of know a little bit more about that. Okay, good question. Um, it's a case of scale, I think. Um, so and and how long we've been at it. Um, so there were many good initiatives to try and support Gaelic before the Language Act of 2005. Um, the Language Act didn't come out of nothing. There had been many um, local and government initiatives um, before that point. Um, but historically in Scotland, we've been at this a lot uh, shorter, a lot less length of time than, than they have been in Wales. Um, we look quite regularly to see what they're doing in Wales to learn from them um, in terms of their education system, their legal system, um, how they work in communities. But the, commu the, the, the scale of their language communities and the ambition of the Welsh government to have half a million speakers of Welsh by, I think it's 2050, um, is way beyond the aspirations or probably the potential of what we could achieve in Scotland for, for some time yet. Thank you. Um, there's some view that the, is it Frisian settlers yeah. in influenced Doric and other variety, other varieties of Northern Scots. Is there any evidence that this could have also happened in Northeast Gaelic? Hmm. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. And um, Oh, I don't know the answer to that. How you would find out the answer to that, would I'm not sure whether it'd be possible to investigate that, whether there'd be enough examples of, there probably would be enough examples of North East um, Gaelic dialects um, to explore that, but I don't know, sorry. No worries. <laughs> um... We've still got a little bit more time if anyone does have any other questions. Um, if not, that can also be a nice little point to, to wrap up. I also, as someone who has done a little bit of family tree research into, and I'm very Northeast Scotland <laughs> born and bred, I am now super intrigued to see what I can go back and see on censuses and if I can find out um, if any of my relatives from like 1891 who were in the kind of Shire um if they maybe they maybe could speak gaelic that wasn't really something yeah. i'd kind of crossed my mind previously um so now I, I feel a little bit inspired to kind of go back down the rabbit hole of <laughs> the family tree research um yeah but anyway that was a little side note um i've also just seen there's another i think it's a comment yeah do you yeah, yeah so take that one yeah. um so according to john mckinnis gaelic speakers in braemar pronounced in Shaw, similar to in Jaw. Yeah, um, some really fascinating evidence about the this, the phonology of um, the sounds of Gaelic in the Northeast. Um, so we have, we, just, we have information in the, the Atlas, the Linguistic Atlas of Gaelic Scotland. Um, the, Seamus Grant, James Grant has done a lot of work on um, illustrating um, Gaelic sounds um, and based on place names and I'm, I'm trying to think now off the top of my head that there are a few place names that have that z sound where we don't have it in other dialects um, so yeah some really interesting things happening with the the dialect as it was spoken um, that I haven't had time to go into today um, it's probably a bit too specialist to talk about um, uh, how the, the Gaelic dialects of the, the Northeast differed from um, a reimagined standard Gaelic. There is no standard Gaelic, but you know, if you were to compare uh, the Northeast dialects to uh, a Hebridean dialect, um, find big differences in terms of certain sounds um, and also lots of missing um, end syllables and, and such like. Thank you. I'll let you take the next uh, question. Yeah. Hmm. So Gaelic influenced um, Scots in terms of vocabulary. So Buroch, I was just talking to uh, a colleague just before I started this who comes from uh, Lossiemouth. Um, and we both just said, oh, what a Buroch, because we saw a bit of a mess. And it's, it was a word known to her, the Northeast. If you don't know it, it means mess 
um, and it's uh, it's Gaelic in origin. Um, was there an influence on the sound system? Um, I almost want to ask Derek if he's still around, if he knows that, because I don't know the answer to that. Because um, I don't know, I, I couldn't claim to be uh, have any real knowledge of Doric or Scots other than uh, a hobby knowledge from having lived here for so long. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I just, I'm just pausing just in case someone wants to pop in another little question. Um, if not, it is kind of getting closer to five. So that might be a nice little point to to wrap up, um, especially about how language kind of different influences seep into to words that we still use nowadays, which is cool. Um, so thank you so much, Michelle. I apologise that I can't say thank you in Gaelic. Um, but thank I can teach you, Chloe. It's tap alive. Tap alive. Tap alive. Okay, I think I'll practice that. <laughs> I'll practice that afterwards. But yeah, thank you so much for um, kind of giving up your time this afternoon to um, present to us. That was really interesting. Um, I love when we get a little bit of like local history. I think a lot of our alumni feel the same. So thank you so much to everyone who's also Great. joined us today. Um, I hope that you guys enjoy the rest of your evenings or if you're joining us from overseas, your very late evenings or your afternoons. So thank you so much. Um, and we'll have another talk in a, a few weeks' time. So thanks, everyone. Okay. Arshan Live, Aikibalish, Tapalish. Bye. Bye bye.